Greetings! Today you are joining me from Lake Placid, New York, where I'm coaching the ski team at their national competition. This is a venue that is full of history. It is the site of the 1932 as well as the 1980 Olympics, the place where the dream team, the Miracle on Ice, uh, did play the Russians and won, and also the place where Eric Haydn won his five gold medals. So it is steeped in history and tradition, but I was thinking to myself, for every one of of those athletes who went down in history as a success was another athlete who actually got sick and was faced with a pathogenic organism and spent their Olympics um, getting tested for something like Staphylococcus aureus. Those, of course, are the people that don't go down in history. So let's begin our conversation today looking at the uh, diagnostic tests that we've been learning for how to differentiate the staphs from the streps. Remember that this differentiation is absolutely key because if you do take a throat swab as all of you did and you put it onto a plate and you see beta hemolysis how do you know whether you have staphylococcus aureus or whether you have streptococcus pyogenes well you need to go ahead and differentiate in a couple of different ways right salt tolerance was one that we talked about put it on an MSA we also talked about um, looking for the catalase magic bubbles and of course at the end once you do get those bubbles and you know you have a staph remember that the effect effective way of um, definitively identifying Staphylococcus aureus is the coagulase test. So the coagulase test is what clots blood plasma, turning fibrinogen into fibrin, making the blood plasma stick in the bottom of the tube. So these are two uh, pictures that I took where you can see that if you turn the tube upside down, all the way upside down, Staphylococcus aureus will stay in the bottom of that tube. And actually I have a really interesting article uh, from Applied Microbiology that talks about interpretation of coagulase tubes for identification of Staph aureus. And what they're arguing in this abstract is that the coagulase tube has to be fully positive in order to be considered Staphylococcus aureus. So if you can't turn it upside down like you see me doing in this picture, then it can't be definitiv definitively identified as Staphylococcus aureus. Of course, a lot of that has to do with a test that is properly inoculated and incubated, and hopefully for your unknowns, if you end up with Staphylococcus aureus, all of those things will be true. 97% of all staph aureus strains are coagulase positive, so as I said, this is a definitive, aka presumptive, test for Staphylococcus aureus. We have some of those for streps as well. Remember our mnemonic device where we said op, uh, Taxos P is optichin. We did that in our last vodcast, um, and we recognize that that definitively identifies Streptococcus pneumoniae. So Streptococcus pneumoniae will be sensitive to the antibiotic optichin, whereas other streps that are normal flora, like strep mitis is the normal flora of our throat, that is going to be Taxos P resistant. Taxos A definitively uh, is used to identify Streptococcus pyogenes, the causative agent of strep throat. So once you do see beta hemolysis on a throat swab plate, if you did that deep down stab and you see the very clear mark of Streptolysin O at the bottom of that, you would want to go ahead and do a Taxos A disc test to see if you see sensitivity because that would indicate that you had indeed Streptococcus pyogenes or strep throat. So definitive tests are extremely important because they're sort of at the bottom of the line of a bunch of biochemical tests. As you're putting together for your um, unknown organisms, you're going to determine a scheme by which you will identify those unknowns. And you always want to put definitive tests at the bottom. Propose them as the last, the most presumptive, the most indicative test that you'll do. Let's talk just a moment about Kligler's iron auger and come back to our KIA tubes. Remember the KIA we mentioned might try to do just too darn many things at once. It differentiates bacteria based on their ability to ferment glucose and lactose. Remember that an organism that can ferment glucose will burn through that glucose quickly, using it all up leaving then the lactose, organisms that can move on to the lactose will do so, it's present in excess, so the tube will stay yellow over yellow. But of course, not all organisms can do that. Such pathogenic organisms as Shigella dysenteriae tend to be lactose negative. They're glucose positive, but lactose negative. Now I want you to begin to think about what that would look like in a KIA, and in a moment we're gonna do some practice. 
We also recognize that KIA, in its, in its rush to do absolutely everything, also tries to look for the production of gas. So in a, in a KIA tube that, um, that is gas positive, we will often see little breaks and fissures and bubbles in the auger. It'll even lift the tube off of the bottom sometimes. That is, the auger will pop up off the bottom of the glass tube and, and you'll see this little region of gas underneath. But not always, not all gas forming microbes have this really clear distinguishable gas pattern. So that's why I say that KIA maybe tries to do too many things. Both Proteus mirabilis and E. coli produce gas, so if you see that in those, you won't be terribly surprised. Hydrogen sulfide production, of course, we know that always um, the H2S gas re reacts with the iron in the auger and creates an iron sulfide, which we know to be a very black precipitate. We're going to practice this a little bit, and I've got some pictures that we're going to use to practice, but I'm going to go inside so that I can um, sit down and draw this, but hey, welcome to Lake Placid. Wonderful. We're going to play a game of the KIA gets real. That is, we're going to look at actually pretty poor pictures that I've taken from the lab, and we're going to be looking at KIA tubes that maybe look a lot like the KIA tubes that you're going to see in lab. That is, they may be slightly imperfect, but likely how your KIA tubes will come out. So let's begin with this particular picture, and I hope you're recognizing the slant and the butt of the tube. So let's remind ourselves that in a KIA tube there are two regions on the tube. There's the slant, and then there's the butt. So the slant is this region here, and the butt is this region down here. So, butt, slant. Okay, so now that we've found both regions of the tube, we can um, interpret the glucose and lactose fermentation. Because if we notice that both the butt of the tube and the slant of the tube are yellow, then we would say yellow over yellow, and that would tell us that this organism could ferment both glucose and lactose. That is, it fermented the glucose first, used it up, and moved on to the lactose and kept on fermenting that lactose. Now, you should be able to fill out the table called uh, interpreting the KIA results as you're looking at these uh, tubes, and I hope that this will be a creative way to do that. So what do you think? This tube looks pretty dang yellow. I think we can probably say for sure that we have over yellow, right? So if we say that we typically write slant over butt we can most certainly say that we have yellow on the bottom. Now, this looks pretty yellow everywhere, in fact, except for maybe a touch of red right here. Now, my guess is that with this tube, this is yellow over yellow, but maybe it got left a little more than overnight in the incubator. Maybe somebody forgot it or overslept their alarm and didn't get in right away. So it looks like this is more or less yellow over yellow, so we would say lac positive, gluc positive. We would say that this ferments both sugars. However, let's take a look at another one. So I'm going to go ahead and upload another picture. Aha! Here we go. Here's another one. Again, not my best photograph ever, but I think we can get a pretty good look at the slant and the butt. To me, it looks like the slant is red. So this is red over black. Uh-oh, that doesn't sound like anything we're used to interpreting. So a red slant over a black butt. So this looks like a red slant over a black butt. This isn't something we're familiar with seeing, but one thing that I can tell you is that if we see a black butt, that is, we know that there's hydrogen sulfide production, so this indicates the production of H2S. Perhaps this is Proteus mirabilis, an epic H2S producing bacterium. But the other thing is I can tell you is that if the butt looks black, we know that it's obscuring a yellow butt. That's always true. So a black butt means a yellow butt. That's something with the KIA that you just have to remember. And of course, that's why I say again, it tries to do too many things at once. So this is red over yellow, meaning that it ferments glucose, right, eats it all up, and then it runs out of glucose, 
or that's when it can no longer use the lactose. It's like, no, I can't use lactose. This is a bacterium that can't use lactose. And so we see it begin to use proteins that produces the amino, uh, that deaminates the proteins, that produces uh, ammonia, which we know to be a base, and we know that that turns the slant red. And we remember that the utilization of proteins is an aerobic process. So red over yellow, that means that this is gluc positive, lac negative, which, hey, check it, that means that this is potentially a much more pathogenic microorganism. This is no E. coli, so we may have something that is very much disease-causing. Let's get rid of some of my chicken scratch, and then we can bring in another practice picture and see if we can interpret this one. So get ready, gear up, the game is on. Boom, there we go, look at that. This one looks pretty clear to interpret, even though once again, this is a very poor photograph that I took. But notice that the slant looks to be red over a yellow butt. So this would mean that it ate up all the glucose, turned yellow, and then couldn't go onto the lactose, so it ate the proteins, stayed red. So we know this means this is lac negative, gluc positive, right? Could this be something that's more pathogenic? You tell me. Let's, let's upload one more. Let's try one more. Oh yeah, probably my poorest photograph yet, but check it out. This is red over red. So it's a red slant and a red butt. This means lac negative, but it means gluc, pos gluc negative as well. So this does not, it's a non-fermenter. Hey, look. I think that's labeled Pseudomonas aeruginosa, so all aerobic all the time, not a fermenter. In fact, that's a completely non-fermentative organism. So I hope that using this kind of fun, you know, KIA gets real game, you can fill in that table as far as interpreting KIA results. The next test that we're going to look at is the most difficult test that we will do. It is called the nitrate test, and it literally looks at an organism's ability to reduce nitrate, converting it from nitrate into nitrite, and then depending upon the organism into something that's a more reduced form of nitrogen. For example, in some denitrifying bacteria, they convert it all the way to nitrogen gas. As you might guess, bacteria that can do this are pivotal in the nitrogen cycle, and particularly those that can convert all the way from nitrate to nitrite to nitrogen gas. The enzyme that reduces nit nitrate is called nitratase, or sometimes for short, it's called nitrate reductase, or I guess I, for long, right? The full name is nitrate reductase, and that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? <laughs> so we recognize that this is the reaction where nitrate gets reduced with, of course, as, as we recall, that's the transfer of electrons onto nitrate to form nitrite. Other electron transfers can happen, and that leads to the formation of fully reduced uh, compounds of nitrogen. This is, can be a nitrogen incorporation reaction, and as I mentioned, can be one that's very environmentally pertinent. We're going to cut to me in the lab, so we're going to visit with me a little bit back in the lab to have a more full and complete explanation of this nitrate test. All right, guys. So, you know, it turns out that if I'm not performing the biochemical test I love, I love the biochemical test I'm performing. And today we're going to be doing the nitrate test. And the nitrate test is complex because it turns out that it's not like most of the other biochemical tests where you either have red or yellow, it's one color or another, and it's positive or it's negative. On this test, there's many ways to be positive, or at least two there is, um, and only one way to be negative. And so you have to pay attention to when a tube turns red, not, not just if a tube, tube turns red. So let's go ahead and, and look at what we have here. These are our nitrate test tubes um, from the previous lab. And we're going to be adding the reagents that allow us to interpret those tubes. So the two reagents that we're going to be adding are nitrate one, and that's a sulfonylic acid, so an acid. And then the other one is nitrate two, which is um, dimethyl alpha naphthalamine, which is an organic. And so nitrate one and nitrate two um, will actually interact with the compound nitrite. And if a bacterium converts nitrate into nitrite, that is, it's a reduction, then we're going to see that the nitrite will react with nitrate one and nitrate two, and it's going to cause a red color change. 
So we're actually looking for that red color change after the addition of the two reagents. If we see it, we can immediately say that our test is positive. So let's actually start out with the two here from your previous um, examples, and we're going to add about seven drops of nitrate water. reaction to occur. Aha, voila. So you can start to see the red color change. It's getting pink. It's going to get pinker. It's going to then eventually turn red. Um, so this organism is going to be positive for reducing nitrate to nitrite. So it's positive for ni the nitrate test, or we can say it's positive for nitrate reductase, or we could say it's positive for nitratase. Those enzymes are sort of, those terms are used simultaneously for the enzymes. So nitrate reductase or nitratase. So we get to see that dark uh, red color change. So this is one way to be positive, is by converting the nitrate to nitrite, and it stops there and reacts with your nitrate one and two um, reagents. So let's go ahead then and look at um, a reaction that can be positive the second way, which is if you add nitrate 1 and nitrate 2 and you see no color change, it could mean that the organism has reduced the nitrate to nitrite and then it's kept on reducing it to some other nitrogenous compound, maybe even nitrogen gas. Let's look at one where that's the case. In fact, this is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So in this case, we're going to add nitrate 1 or it could be positive via the second mechanism of taking it beyond nitrate. 
So we're going to add zinc, and zinc is what tells us that. And we remember that if it turns pink, uh, pink after zinc, pink after zinc means that it's negative. So let's add some zinc. And once again, we need to give that zinc some time to react. So while we're waiting, let me show you a little more about the nitrogen test. This is a hard one to understand, so sometimes a picture helps. Remember that in this test, the enzyme that we're searching for is the enzyme that converts nitrate to nitrite. That's a reduction. And the enzyme that does that is often called nitrogen. As I mentioned earlier, it's also sometimes called nitrate reductase. So we're looking to see if an organism has that enzyme, and it can reduce the nitrate to nitrite. But we're going to see later, this is a really important part of the nitrogen cycle. So many microbes that can do this help in nitrogen cycling. But one, one way that this can get done is that the nitrate can convert, get converted to nitrite, and it stops there. So we can say that there are two ways to be positive. Let me label the positive ways here uh, in pink. One way to be positive is to convert nitrate to nitrate and stop right there. If that's the case, when you add those two reagents, nitrate 1 and nitrate 2, those two compounds, the acid and the organic, interact with nitrite. And that creates a red color. So if you turn red after the addition of nitrate 1 and nitrate 2, that's the first way to be positive. Right? by turning red after nitrate 1 and nitrate 2. The second way to be positive, though, is in organisms that convert nitrate to nitrite, but they keep on going, and they take it all the way to some other reduced form of nitrogen, maybe even nitrogen gas, right? And so in that case, there would be no nitrite there to react with nitrate 1 and nitrate 2, ever. So this would be, labeled in pink, the second way to be positive. Now there's only one way to be negative. The only way to be negative is to leave it as nitrate, right? So one way to be negative, two ways to be positive. Let's look at what would happen then if we had anything other than the first way to be positive, right? In that first way, you add the nitrate one, nitrate two, and everything turns red. But if, if you add nitrate one and nitrate two, and there's no color change at all, then you know that there's two possibilities. One, the organism is negative. Two, the organism further reduced the nitrate to other nitrogenous compounds. So you have to determine which way it is then. So after adding nitrate one and two and seeing no color change, your next step is to add zinc. So with the addition of the metal zinc, zinc will convert nitrate to nitrite. Thus, if you have a negative organism, the zinc will reduce the nitrate to nitrite, and then it will react with nitrate 1 and nitrate 2, and that will give a red color. Thus, pink after zinc means negative. However, if you add the zinc, and the organism has converted the nitrogen to other nitrogenous compounds, then you're going to see nothing, because other nitrogenous compounds plus zinc equals no color change. Cool. So that helps me understand the nitrate test. I hope it helps you guys too. Oh, let's check our two. Hey, yay, pink after zinc. Remember after the addition of the two reagents, nitrate one and two, an immediate red color indicates that there is, in fact, the reduction of nitrate to nitrite and that that reacts with nitrate 1 and 2 to form the red color. We also recall that another possibility after adding nitrate 1 and 2 was to say colorless, but of course that in and of itself it doesn't tell us anything. So if we add the zinc, as you recall, then that, of course, will convert the nitrate to nitrite in a negative and that will turn red. Things like Pseudomonas aeruginosa are, of course, positive for the reduction of nitrate, and they take it all the way to nitrogen gas. So upon adding zinc, there's absolutely nothing that happens, so it stays colorless after zinc. So while we see two ways to, in fact, be positive, either red after nitrate 1 and 2 or no color after the addition of zinc, 
there's only one way to be negative, and that's why I always remember pink after zinc means negative. And if you recall that and the fact there's only one way to be negative, it's a helpful way to always know what's going to happen in this test or how to interpret the results. This is a uh, quick challenge for us looking at our expected results, and the one that we already proposed a hypothesis for was Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Remember we had hypothesized that it would in fact be positive for nitrate reduction and that we, we hypothesized that it would stay colorless after the uh, addition of zinc. So this is kind of what we are thinking is going to happen there. Now it turns out that others are positive such as E. coli and Staphylococcus epidermidis. However, they turn red after nitrate 1 and 2. So this is our expectation here on the right a red color after adding the two reagents. Streptococcus pneumoniae is negative, so it will be pink after zinc. Today is a very exciting day because we will be starting our unknowns, so you will need to think about how to be organized with these unknowns. You have got to be organized because if you forget to label something or if you accidentally put your B into a tube that is for your A, all heck will break loose. This is not a good thing. So be very organized. Always make sure that you're labeled in all, all ways. Please also make sure that you're coming back and you're performing a gram stain after every single lab for isolation. We have to make absolutely certain that we have a peer culture. That's why we keep gram staining. If all of a sudden you look at your gram stain and you're like, oh dear, I see both purple cocci and pink rods, this is not a good thing. Uh, then that literally means that you've got contamination and you have to start over again. This is going to proceed at the rate of your most competence, <laughs> you know, it, the, the, the utmost rate of your competence, <laughs> because we, we can't, um, there is no, it's no foolproofing this. It's yours. It's just yours. And so you're going to have to get all of the tests right in order to identify the unknown. And if something goes wrong, you just have to go back and you just have to do it again and you just have to fall behind. So this is, there's no uh, extra, what we think of as those uh, protective mattresses that we put around undergraduate labs where we don't let you fail. This is not one of those. We'll let you fail and that's a good thing sometimes. So just bear in mind that the more organized you are, the better things are going to go. You have a due date coming up. You are going to make a scheme for the identification of your unknown, putting forward the tests that you want to perform on that unknown. You can do this in a visual way where you say, okay, first I'm going to do the um, gram stain. If it's gram positive, then I'm going to do the catalase test. Uh, if it bubbles, then I'm going to put it on a mannitol salt auger, right? You can use that kind of if, if, if statement and maybe do it in a visible flow chart or you can do it in a paragraph. It's totally up to you how you're going to put forward that scheme. Uh, you also need to have a hypothesis as the, to the identity of your unknown and this is where things get a little bit tricky. So I am going to quickly pull up the, uh, the description for this assignment. Okay, here is on page XIII your unknown hypotheses and references assignment. And this will go through blow by blow and say what you need to include. But the most difficult part of this is the fact that we are going to be asking you to please write using a particular journal style format. So I'm going to go through an example. And I just want to read to you from this example and show you how you're going to be doing your citations. So bear in mind that this particular unknown is not one of our unknowns, but it makes for a good example. Lyme disease is characterized by a rash that looks like a bullseye, quote unquote. This rash is commonly accompanied by fever, fatigue, headache, joint, and muscle aches. Now it's likely that this student that would have written this hypothesis would have gotten a clue that said these things. It said something like this was isolated from a patient with a bullseye rash. And then that student went out and did some research and found a reference in the clinical and neurocognitive features of post-Lyme syndrome that allowed them to understand that this might be the Lyme disease causing pathogen. So the citation style that was chosen to cite these references was from Nature Review's Microbiology. 
So we are asking you to choose a journal. You could choose the Journal of Bacteriology or Applied and Environmental Microbiology or the Journal of Infectious Disease. And we want you to look up the instructions to authors for that particular journal. I'm going to show you what I mean. If you pull up Google and in the Google search bar, you just say instructions to authors and the journal that you're looking for, say Journal of Bacteriology, then you can pull up the instructions to authors and they will tell you how they want their authors to cite their sources. So pick a journal and then do that. This is the format for the Nature Reviews Microbiology. Don't use that format because it's the one that the example uses. So going on in this hypothesis, based on the similarity of these symptoms to those of the patients, as well as the spiral cell shape and gram-negative cell wall of this bacterium, ah, so here we're calling on a bit more. The symptoms, yes, but also the cell shape and the, the gram stain. So you'll have that information that you can use to help inform your hypothesis as well. So notice that sentences one and two are calling on background information. Remember that good hypotheses are grounded in background information. Of course, they are also testable and clear. Let's see if we have that. Phenotypic data observed growth and staining patterns as well as biochemical tests will indicate that unknown 295B is the Lyme disease causing pathogen Borrelia burgdorferi. Yes, absolutely. Look at that. We can either support or disprove this hypothesis, it's clear that we are stating that using these methods, this unknown will be this. And that is a bold and testable statement. So that's what you'll want for your unknown uh, hypotheses. You're going to have one for both your A and your B. Your A is a presumed gram positive, your B is a presumed gram negative. You will also be writing an unknown ID plan. I have included a rubric for this unknown ID plan so that you can know what aspects you will be assessed on. You will be assessed on those same aspects no matter the format that you utilize to do this plan. It can be a picture, it can be a flow chart, it can be a paragraph, however you choose to put forward the test that you know you're going to need to do in order to identify your unknown. Marvelous. Get jazzed on that and get started.